I'm going to continue this series on multiplication alongside with Pastor Steve that he's also talking about multiplication as well. And I believe that God wants to multiply our lives this year. Can I get an amen and agreement there? He wants to multiply us. And there's an area of our life that we must understand that we must multiply, and that's the word I just said, is life. The Bible says that God came to give you life and to give it more abundantly. Amen? God wants to give you life. Here's, here's something that I, 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 was, I was listening to a lot of, I listened to a lot of audio books. And so I was listening to this one person who was saying, when, when, you're, when you're hungry, you know, how do you know that you're hungry? How do you know that you're hungry? Your body tells you you're hungry, right? How do you know when you're tired? Well, your body tells you I'm sleepy, so you get some sleep. How do you know that you need shelter? Like if it's raining or if it's cold, you, your body tells you, hey, get inside. It's time to get out of this cold, get out of this rain, get out of this thunder. How do you know when, when, you're, when, you, when you need something to drink? Your body tells you, I'm thirsty. So here I ask you the question, how do you know when you need to grow spiritually? How do you know? What tells you? What, what tells us in our body? Our body's not going to tell you you need to grow spiritually. You need to, you, need to, you need to grow. What tells you that you need to grow? What tells you that you need more life? What inside of you, what happens to you? Because everything else, we have a feeling. We have a feeling of, of hunger, of, of, of thirst, of, of shelter, of, of need of oxygen. We need, we need these five things in our life. Without these five things, we'll die. But then we need these other things called being, being associated with people. We need to be with people. We need to stay with people. We need that communication with people. But what tells you that you need? What inside of you triggers you to say, I need to grow? I need more life. I need more joy. I need what tells you. Do we wait until we're depressed, until we finally say, oh, I need, I need help? Do we wait until we're so anxious that we can't do anything else? We normally wait. People normally wait until it's so tragic that they have to make a decision. We normally wait until we're going to start working out, until the doctor says, you better start working out. Then we start working out, but all the other time, we're like, ah, we're not going to work out. We put it off, we put it off, we put it off. And so what tells us that we need to grow? Let me tell you the first thing that, that, that comes against us is fear. Fear always magnifies things. Peace always brings it to what it really is. Fear always magnifies the future. Fear always magnifies, what am I going to do with my, when I retire? Am I going to have enough money? Oh, my gosh. Fear always thinks of things that are not even worry, worthy of being, uh, being thought about right now. They asked a bunch of people. They asked a, a survey. They asked some people that were in their late, late stages of their life. And they asked them, what's the one thing if you were to say, if you could go back, what's the one thing you would say you would do? And they said, I wish majority of the people that were in, in, already in nursing homes, already towards the end of their life, they already says, I wish if I could go back, I would worry less. I would worry less. The things that I worried about never came true. I would worry less and do more. I would worry less and live life. Instead of life trying to live me, I would live life. Instead of life telling you what to do, you tell life, hey, this is what I want to do. See, we live a life of worry and anxiety. We're not, I, I watched a documentary on HBO. It's, it was a documentary about uh, one nation under stress. And it's amazing how stressful we are. And we're all looking for the one thing, and that's life. But we're stressed out. We're overstressed. We're, in, we're under we're so much stuff going on. Kids nowadays, the youth that today, the college people today have never seen the things that when I was going to, to high school, I didn't have to deal with that, and I didn't have to deal with, they are at such a high level now, that anxiety and, and depression and all these things, are called, and they're looking for life, just looking for life, when the answer is right there. Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians, and it was, it was a letter that he wrote, and he was trying to tell them about how to find life. Interesting thing is, is in that documentary, 
it said uh, one nation under stress, it said that most people are going, we don't know where to go to find peace and to find the answer. And I'm like, are you kidding me? The Bible, it says that if come all to me, those who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But the enemy, the Bible says, he has blinded the eyes of those of those people that they're, they're like, well, let me go to this. Let me try that. Let me try this. I need more of this. If I wear this, if I go here, if I go there. And so it's such, it's, we, such we live in, a, in an anxious world that we don't know what to do. We're just like running around with, just like running around with our heads cut off. Just like, what do I do? What do I do? They also found out that people who live life and lived it with a purpose also were more fulfilled. They felt, they felt fulfilled in their life. That's why GROW is such important because GROW helps you to find the purpose, the reason why you were made, the reason why you were placed in this world. You're just not here to work at such and such a place and make them more money. You're not, that's not your purpose. That's what you do. That's what you do, it's not who you are. God gave you a purpose. He gave you a reason why you're supposed to be on this world. And until you find that purpose, you're going to go from church to church, from thing to thing, from hobby to hobby, until you finally find your purpose. And when you find your purpose, you feel fulfilled. They also asked people in, in, that, in, that, in that survey, if you could go back, well, what would you do? They said, we would go back and I would change my major. I would not do the thing that I wanted. To, I should have done the thing that I was passionate about. I should have done the thing that I really want. Because at the end of the day, when everybody's gone out of the house, when you're sitting there, and when you're there, what are you going to say? Are you going to say, I am fulfilled, I left this world, I left a mark, I left something in this world? Or are you going to be sitting there going, I wish I could have lived life a lot different? But see, we don't have to live like that. We can live life to the fullest. And the Galatians, Paul writes, and he's talking to them, and saying we can live life. And Paul says this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1 and 5. It says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor from man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and the brethren who are with me, to the church of Galatia. So he's writing this, this letter. And it's not a nice letter. It's a, it's a correction letter. He's writing this letter to correct them. And look what he says. Grace to you. So he says, hey, hey I'm just going to give you grace first, all right? Grace to you. Peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sin that he might deliver us from this present age according to the will of God the Father whom be the glory forever, ever. Amen. Then in verse 6 he comes in. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So he's telling them, wait a minute. I'm, it's amazing how you're turning from what God told you, what we taught you, you're turning. And look what he says, which is really no gospel at all. They were teaching that the people, the Galatians people, were teaching them that you have to work your way to get to God. That you have to work, you have to work, you have to do these, these working things. It was religion. They basically said you have to do this, 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 and this in order for God to love you. You have to do this, 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 and this for God to then no longer be mad at you. You have to do this, 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 and this for the sin to be removed away from you. And so we see that Paul was like telling them, the teaching that I told you, you're not following the same teaching. And here's the lesson. We think that once we find God that we have to get back into religious relationship, but God wants us to live, leave religion away and have relationships with him. Amen? You see, religion itself, the word religion means bondage. If you go study it, it's bondage. In other words, you're forced. I have to do these prayers. I have to give this. I have to do that. And anything that is making you do something is bondage. If I don't do this, this will happen. The, if I don't go here, if I miss a service, or if I do this, or if I do that, or if I'm doing this, I am, I'm going to go to hell. I'm going to go this. I'm gonna go. I mean, I was raised that way sometimes where it's like if, if you're doing something wrong, you better have, you know, if, if the plane crashes, 
You, you better have, have said all your prayers and made sure you said every sin and says, Lord, forgive me of all my sins, Lord, before I crash. I, I, every sin, Lord, even the ones I'm forgetting. <laughs> I was living a life of fear. And I remember living like that. I remember I was like, Lord, uh, I'm, I'm scared right now, Lord. So all the sin, Lord, the ones that I'm forgetting and the ones that you know of and the ones that nobody knows, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord. And those other ones, Lord, and, uh, and, and, and instead of living, instead of loving him, I'm living in fear. And that's not what God wants us to do. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It says, eventually some people are throwing you into a confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Perversion is just something like love, and then it's lust. Where it's money is a blessing, but it all can be used as something good or bad. You've perverted, or you've made it wicked. The word, the word wicked is when you, you take something like a wicker chair, it's bent wood, it's crooked, it's twisted. And so the word of God is not, it's a straight thing, and the, and the enemy comes to twist the word of God. The, the, the enemy comes to twist the, his promises and make you think, did God really say? Did God really say that to you? Did God really, is God really going to come through for you? That's the enemy twisting the word of God and trying to make you think a different way. And so event, the Bible says that, hey, it's perverted the gospel. Most, he says, most have found God and most are finding Christ, but by grace, not by works. Grace is, and I've, I've heard pastors say that grace is the power and the desire to do the will of God. Grace is the power and the desire to do the will of God. So when God gives you grace, he's giving you the power and the desire to serve him. So the desire means I want to be at church, not I have to go to church. All right, there's a difference. If I told my wife, hey, I guess I have to take you out. That wouldn't be sounding pretty nice, right? That wouldn't sound nice. I guess I have to take you out, right? I have to give you a gift. I have to. No. I want to. Grace is the power and the desire to do his will. So when you have grace, you have the power to say no to sin. You have the desire to worship him and to come to church and to give, not to, not to be forced to. And you have the power, desire to do his will, to do the word of God. That's grace. And the Bible is built on grace. Christianity is not about choosing the right church. Christianity is, is all about surrendering your life to God. Surrendering your life to God fully. See, I know there's a lot of people that says he's, 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 he's not Lord over my life, but he's, he's Christ. He's Jesus. I've given him my life, but he's not Lord over my life. There's a difference between God being the Lord over your life and him being your salvation. Being Lord over your life means that he has every area of your life. He has a say in your life. But there's areas of our life that we say, well, Lord, I'll give you my heart, but I can't give you my mind. And I can't give you my soul. I can give you my heart. My, I can't give you all that. My spirit belongs to you. But my mind, will, and emotions, they belong to me. But God says, I want all of it. God wants your mind, your will, and your emotions. But we must give unto him. We must surrender. It's in, and the whole thing about it is the way you're able to multiply more life in your life is for you to surrender your life. We think the way to get more life is that I've got to go forward. No, the way, you, the way you get more life is as you die to yourself. It's always the opposite. The first, you know, be last, the last will be first, and, the, you know, uh, give and it shall be given unto you. Pray for your enemies. God is, it's always as, almost as if in order to get ahead, I've got to just die to say, in order to go this way, I've got to go that way. And God's, God, I want to go that way. You've got to go this way. But I want to go that way, God. Well, you've got to go that way. It don't make sense. Yes, but trust me. And a lot of times, the key question here, you can add that underlying blank. The key question is, how am I going to get more life? What's my approach to serve and worship God? Most people choose the same pathway like others do, and they don't serve God. What's my, how am I going to get more life? 
if I'm hungry, I know I go to Whataburger. Come on, somebody. I go to Whataburger. I go to Taqueria. I go somewhere. If I'm thirsty, I get a drink. If I'm sleepy, I go to sleep. If I'm, if I'm tired, I go take a nap. If, I, if I'm bored, you know, I go watch Netflix. Or, I mean, I mean, something. But when you're spiritually hungry, what do you do? When you're spiritually thirsty, what do you do? When you're spiritually uh, needing nourishment, when you feel spiritually lonely, what do you do? What we normally do is we do a work. Well, I guess I got to go to church. I feel, I feel guilty. I, I feel bad. I haven't given anything. I better, I, better, I better tip God. I better give him a tip. Let me tip him. I, I, I feel bad. Let me tell you this, guilt never helped or saved anybody. It's when you're fully convinced, it's when you're, you have the grace, the power, and the desire to do his will. That should be your, your, your prayer. It says, God, give me grace. Give me grace. Give me grace. Give me grace. Lord, don't take it away. Don't take this problem away. Give me more, give me more power to overcome it. Let me get through it. I'm going to get through it. I'm an overcomer. Lord, you gave me the power to do it. But, Lord, I want to live life and live it to the fullest. And the way we live life is we give our life. It sounds weird, but the way you get more life is you give your life up. Going back to, to Galatians, the Bible says that it's, it's by grace alone that we are saved. And so it's foundational that God has says that it's by grace it's not by works. The Bible says in, in Genesis, and I'm going to give you just a few, few scriptures in Genesis just to lay a foundation. Genesis says, now the Lord had God planted a garden in the east of Eden. And there he put a man and he had formed. And God made all kinds of trees grow around the, the ground. And the trees were, were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In other words, we had to make a choice. He, get, he, let, he let man make a choice. Since the beginning, God has never said, you're gonna, I'm going to force you to love me. God says, you choose you this day who you're going to serve. See, no one goes to hell. People choose to go there. God doesn't send people to hell. People say, why does God send people to hell? People choose to go there. People make a decision in life. A lot of times we, are, we, are, we have to we have to pay the price for the decisions we've made, the consequences. For the, for, the, for, the, for the payment of sin is separation, is death, the Bible says. The Bible says that, hey, you're going to make some decisions in life. They're going to be the wrong decisions. They're gonna be, you're going to have to pay a price, right? But God says, hey, but that price you're going to pay, I've already paid it with my son. And though it's going to go bad for you, I'm going to make it and I'm going to turn it around and make it for your good. And so we must understand that God is there when you make the choice, the bad choice, and the good choice. He's there to give you life. Look, it says in Genesis 16, And the Lord commanded man, you're, you're free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you do, you will certainly die. It will make you religious, and you will certainly ruin your life. That's basically what he's saying. You will re you'll become religious. You'll become, uh, all of a sudden, you must, you must you're, you're tied to this thing. Look what it says. Now the serpent who was more crafty than all the other animals, he said to the woman, did God really say, there he is again, making something God's word and twisting it, making it wicked. You must not eat from any tree. And later on, he says, you will not surely die. Verse 5, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The devil appealed, appealed to her need to be godly, to be godly, to have life. Hey, you can be like God and live forever, have life. He appealed to her, and then something goes bad there. Look what happens. When the woman saw the fruit and that it was good and pleasing to the eye, she took it and ate. She also gave to her husband. He was there too, so don't blame Eve. Come on, somebody. He was there watching the whole thing. He could have said, wait a minute, I don't know. He was right there, who was with her, and he took a bite out of it too. All right? Then his, the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. 
So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Anytime we go after God with religion, we lose our innocency and our, we, we then become shameful. Here you find out that as they, as they, took, the, uh, they took the fruit, the eyes of them were open. They saw themselves, they saw the private areas of their life, and they covered them up and were ashamed of it. But the funny, the under interesting is, is that the leaves, they put leaves and leaves wither. So they had to put more leaves and more leaves and more leaves. And those leaves withered and they had to put more leaves and more leaves and more leaves. And like, hey, these leaves. So then God says, what did he have to do? He had to kill an animal. Someone had to die to cover your sin. So that's when God says, oh, he, he killed, they had to kill an animal and they covered themselves with a dead animal of a carcass because they had to, something covered that shameful act. But it only covered it, it didn't remove it. But then as you know, the, 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 uh, the Lamb of God came away and took away the whole thing. Amen. And so here we see, here's the difference. What's the difference between these things? And I'm gonna, here's, the, here's the whole thing that I laid it all down right here. What are the differences between religion and relationship with God? Here it is. Don't focus on what you do or have done. Focus on what Jesus has done and on his promises. Don't focus on what you do or have done. Focus on what Jesus has done and his promises. Don't focus so much on what you do and what you've done, your mistakes in your past. You know who's over there in your past? You. Jesus has already gone forward. He's already moving forward. Like the angel said at the time when they were there at the, at the, at the gravestone, they said, he's not here. Well, where is he? He's moved on. He's not here. And so you and your past are there. If you were as passionate about your past as you are, of your, if you could be of your future, you would be so much far ahead. Amen? We're so preoccupied with our past that if we're so passionate, if we were to take that same passion, that same guilt, that same, that, that same uh, 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 wishing that we would have not have done that, that dwelling on it and dwelling on it and dwelling on it, if you could just reverse that in the other direction, how far along would you be? How much faith would you have? You put so much negative faith in the past, how much more if you could put positive faith in your future, amen? Think about it. How much time do you spend thinking about your past? You don't have to sit, raise your hand. But I bet you every day you think about your past. Every day you think about yesterday. You think about two years ago. You look at the bill and you go, why did I make that payment? Why did I, why didn't I, why did I make that purchase? That was a bad purchase. We think about our, our relationships. We think about past things. Every day we think about the past. Instead of thinking about the past and that same energy, let's take that same energy and let's move it and let's put our faith toward the future. Because God says, don't focus on what you've done. Focus on what he's already accomplished. He's already finished it. He's already done for you. It's not about you. It's about what, what he's done. It's not about how long. It's not about how long. Did you pray? Oh, did I pray? Did I pray? Did I pray? How long did I pray? No, did you pray? Did you read the word? Yes. What did you get out of the word? Not how long did you read the word. What did you get out of it? Well, pastor, I didn't pray. I haven't prayed all week. I feel bad. Okay. Start praying. <laughs> well, I feel bad. I, 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 I have to read the word. You don't have to do anything. But when you do pray and when you do read the, the word of God, how, it's not about how long you did, but did you hear God's voice when you prayed? Did you hear his voice when you read his, his, his word? When, if you missed a prayer meeting or if you missed a church, that's fine. What did you do? It's all about what did you do? What did you get out of it? You're here at church today. You're not going to just say, that was my to-do list. Check, check. I went to church. No, it was when, when you came to church, what did you get out of church today? Did a word, did I say something? Did you hear something when you're in worship? Did you feel something? Did you release something? Did you, get, did you, did you just find, find God? Did you get, hear a truth? What did you get out of today's message? And the same thing comes when you read his word and when you pray. It's not about the act. It's about what did you get out of being in the presence of him? 
Instead, we're always looking at the works instead of the results. So I don't want you to look at yourself and say, man, I haven't done this, I haven't done that, I haven't done this, I haven't done that, I haven't done this. No. Don't get yourself down. But when you do pray, say, God, I'm about to pray. And Lord, as I pray to you, I know I'm going to hear your voice. It's only going to be five minutes, but Lord, I, I know in that five minutes, Lord, I'm going to hear your voice. Lord, as I open up the word of God, Father, help me find the scripture. When I find that scripture, may, speak to me through your scriptures. I might only, you might only read maybe four or five scriptures, but in that scripture, God spoke to you. It's all about what you're doing. Here's the other one. Don't focus on getting God's approval. Focus on receiving his love. Don't focus on getting his approval. Focus on receiving God's love. Most people, a survey was done, most people in America think that God hates them or God is mad at them. Most people don't go to church because they feel that if they go to church, they don't, they're not worthy to go to church. That they're so bad, that, they're, so, that they're, they're in a bad place in life that they don't need to go to church. That man, going to church, is, that, that's not for them. And we try to get God's approval for him to love us. But God knows, get this, God knows you're going to sin after church today. Probably some of y'all are going to sin. I'm just going to be honest, all right? I'm going to be honest. Some of you are going to go, some, some of you are going to leave today out of the parking lot, drive and go this way, and somebody's going to cut you off and go, ah. The waitress or waiter is going to be like, taking too long, what's happened? I found a hair. I mean, all kinds of things are going to happen. And you're going to lose it. Your neighbor's cat, dog, whatever, tomorrow, you're going, to miss, you're going to miss it. But I'm here to tell you, even though you're going to sin tomorrow, God says, I want to bless you tomorrow. Isn't that awesome that we serve a God that says, even though I know you're going to miss it in, in the year five and 2020 and 2021, I know you're going to mess up this here and this day, but I'm still here to bless you. I still want to prosper you. I still want to love you. I still want to do, I want to bless you so much. That's the God we serve. Don't focus on getting his approval. Just focus on his love. How do you see him determines how you act toward him. How you see a person is how you act toward that person. However you see him. If we were to see the president of the United States or we would see an officer or if you would see an FBI agent or if you would see a doctor, you would see a lawyer, a judge. However you see them and however you see them as they are, that's how you will approach them and that's will determine how you act towards them. So if we see God, do we see him as, a, as, a, as, a, as an overlord? Do we see him as a, as a judge? Do we see him as a police officer? Do we see him as, a, do we see him as, as father? Do we see them as Father God? Do we see him as a loving father or do we see him as an angry person that's ready to strike me? Or do we see God as with his open hands like the prodigal son? He was there. He was open hands. He says, come, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hug you. I'm going to give you the robe of righteousness. I'm going to give you a ring of authority. I'm going to love on you. And see, we have put a bad, we put, we've made God into something that he's not. And the church can sometimes do that where we, we make God into something that he's not. And we make it so hard for people to get, give their life to Christ. After service, we're going to do it. We're gonna, I'm going to make an opportunity for people to give their life. To, and these people have asked me, why do you make it so easy? Because it's that easy. There ha doesn't have to be all these forms and things and stuff. It's just like, hey, say this prayer in your heart. You said it, say it with your mouth. The Bible says when you say it with your mouth, and if you believe in your heart, you are saved. Well, I didn't feel nothing. Well, it doesn't mean that you're not. I didn't feel anything. The hairs in my back, didn't, nothing happened. You know what? It's called faith. And the same faith that you said, yes, I'm saved. If I were to ask you right now, are you saved? You say, yes, I am. That same faith is the same faith you used to get healed. Is the same faith you used to get well, to get prosperity. You don't, you don't, you, nothing changed in you. Maybe something changed in you to give, gave you salvation. But I ask you, are you saved? Yes, I am. What is telling you? Does it, do you have a tattoo now that says saved? Do you know what happened? Nothing happened. You just believed in your heart and so you believed. The same thing God says, if you want life, if you want to have multiply your life and multiply life in your life, you must follow him. 
and you must give your life to him to get life. Here's the last one. Don't focus on your external duties. Focus on your internal desires. Don't focus on your external duties. Focus on your internal desires. We always focus on the external duties. I have to. I have to. I have to. But you know, the Bible says we love because God loved us first. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and me. While you and I were just partying on, dude, he was like, I love you. And he's there for us. First John, let me give you a couple more scriptures and we're going to close. First John 5, 3. And in fact, this is love for God to keep his commandments. And his commandments are not, what? What's that word? Burdensome. In other words, it's not hard to keep God's commands, to keep his word. If you're not love, if you don't love to read the Bible, coming to church or volunteering or giving your, it's all a chore, it feels hard, then you're doing it the wrong way. If coming to church, reading the word, lifting up your hands in worship, uh, maybe, you know, giving of yourself to, to grow, helping, volunteering, if you find that is very difficult, then you're doing it in the wrong heart, in the wrong way. Because you should be doing it in a joyful way. I love to give my time. I love to, to do my purpose. I love to do this. I love to do that. You should do it in a right heart. 1 John 5, 12, whoever has the Son has what? Has life. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So if you got the Son of God living in you, you have life. It all determines on what you're going to do for that life. Are you going to multiply that life? Remember what I said. When you're hungry, you go get something to eat. When you're thirsty, you go get something to drink. Something tells you inside of you says, I got to go get something to drink. I'm thirsty. But what are you listening to your spiritual man that says, hey, I'm hungry. Hey, I'm thirsty. And what do you do? Do you run to something else or do you, do you, do you give it what it wants? Do you say, I need to spend time in worship. I need to spend time in prayer. I need to go to church. I need to hang out with other people of like faith. And let me tell you this. God is not mad at you. He's, in, he's madly in love with you. For he sent his son to die on the cross. So we must fall in love with Jesus. How do you fall in love? Come on, somebody. How do you fall in love? Come on. I don't want to say nothing, Pastor, because my wife's right next to me. No, no. How do you fall in love? You focus on that person continually. You focus on what they like, what they don't like. They're, they're, what you focus on them. You, 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 like I, whenever I'm, I'm, I'm married somebody, I said, from here on out, you're going to be, I tell the man, you're going to study her. You're going to study her, and you're going to have to study her and study her and find out who she is and what she does. And that's the part of marriage. You've got to continue to study, and that's how you stay in love. You stay in love by continually finding new things, new things, new things, new things. You fall in love by, fi- by studying and finding out what do you like, what don't you like, what, what makes you happy, God, what makes you mad, God, what makes you, what makes you sad, God. I don't want to make you mad. I don't want to make you sad. I want to love you. And that's how you fall in love with God. Don't allow condemnation to come in. Move to Jesus. Move to him and make the right choices every day. And if you mess mess up, get back up, ask for forgiveness, and keep going. That's too easy. Yes, it's that easy. Don't complicate it. Just say, God, Father, I messed up. Lord, help me to make the right decision and move on. You know who's keeping you back is you. By you just saying, there must be something I have to do. I have to whip myself. I have to do something bad. I I did something bad. No, just come to Christ. Come to God. And he says he's willing to take all those bad things of us and give us peace and give us joy. Amen. He wants to give you life and have it to the abundance. Amen. Let's pray right now. Right, Right there where you're at, let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord. I feel your presence here. I I sense a sweet spirit here. Lord, I thank you, Lord, as we talk about you, you show up. And I know your presence is here because the Bible says we're two or more gathered. And whenever we're sharing your word or speaking your word, your presence shows up. And I've, 
I have been sensing your presence this whole time as I've been speaking. A, a sweet spirit, a, just a sensing that you're moving amongst the people and tender, just, just coming onto their heart and telling them that they, you love them. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that this word, Father, is not from me, it's from you. And your word says that, Father, Lord, the word of God comes, not, it, it comes to correct, but it also comes to, to, to heal, and it also comes to point in the right direction. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your presence. I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is here. Lord, all of us are not perfect. Father, you know that we're not perfect. You know that we, we, we're constantly fighting the battle of our mind and fi constantly fighting the battle of our past. But Lord, help us to move that away and to live life and let life multiply in our life this year. The way we live is we must die to ourselves and we must fall in love with you. Lord, I ask you today, if no one knows you today, if they don't know you, if those that are watching by, li by, by video, if those here right now, no one's looking around, everybody's spending time with their, their themselves, search your own heart and say, am I following God because I love him or am I following God because I have to? Am I following him because I, 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 I wanna find out more or is it because I just, I just have to do it? Today is the day where you say, I want to make a decision. Lord, I want you to live in me. I want you to come live in me. Live in my heart. Give me, speak to me, motivate me, move me, direct me, change me into the person I want to be that I need to be, into the purpose that you've called me. And if that's you today, if you, and that's you by, right now by watching by, by video, if that's you and here in this church right now, if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand up. I'm not going to call on you to come up. I just want you to raise your hand. Amen. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else who says, you know what, Pastor? I have never given my life to Christ, but I don't want to leave this place until I've given my life to him. Come on. It's not, amen. Amen. Everybody else. I'm not going to call you up. God sees your hand. God sees your hand. I don't see your hand. God sees your hand. Amen. 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 I see another hand. If you raise your hand, I want you to just say this prayer. You can, say it, you can say it under your voice. You don't even have to say it loud. You can say it under your voice. Say, Father God, thank you for saving me. Come into my life. Be the Lord over my life. I thank you that my life belongs to you. I'll never be the same. I'm going to change because your spirit lives in me. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Give him a clap offering unto the Lord. Come on.